So we are here today with Daryl Anka, a documentary filmmaker, a person behind the, the very famous Bashar. Thank you. So Daryl, welcome. Thank you, Gia. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for having me here today. It was interesting. So uh, as you already know, I've attended a couple of your events. Yes. Well, it wasn't the first time I've heard of Bashar. Obviously, right. I've done my research. I've run into um, uh, lots of the videos on YouTube. Of course, right. I did my research. But I was interested in what Bashar had to say mm -hmm. and um, the, the, um, the whole phenomenon of channeling and so on and so forth. But what really kind of triggered my interest as well is that you are a filmmaker. Yes. And a successful one. So well, thank you. I'd like to think so, but it's <laughs> still sort of new in the game. Uh, I've been in the film industry for over 30 years, but mm -hmm. I started as... Uh, miniature effects and storyboards and sets and mm -hmm. so on and so forth and then eventually transitioned into screenwriting and producing and directing which we're mm -hmm. doing now with my production company that I run with my wife Erica called Zia Films. Mm -hmm. What was uh, one of the uh, very memorable stories about your um, uh, getting into this <clears throat> industry was your story about working um, at the theater? Yeah, it was an amazing synchronicity because I had wanted to go from graphic arts into building three-dimensional miniatures for movies. I was really excited about it, but um, no one was really hiring at the time, and there weren't that many companies doing it. Um, so I didn't really find a way in until one day uh, when Star Wars came out. Um, the theater that was playing in my neighborhood said there are so many lines that we'll hire anyone on the spot to come down and help us <clears throat> control the crowds. So I thought, well, okay, because I'll go down there and get the job because that way I can watch Star Wars as many times as I want for free mm -hmm. to study how they did the special effects. So I went there, I got the job. I was only there for about three months, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> during that three month period, I only took tickets at the front door for 20 minutes to relieve someone who was going on a break. Mm -hmm. So during that one 20 minute period, uh, a technician from Star Wars came in, I recognized him, we struck up a conversation, and he was responsible for getting me the interview with a new company that was just starting out. So they hired me and I got in on the ground floor of making miniatures uh, for uh, sci-fi movies and things like that. And I got to work on like three Star Trek films and Iron Man and Pirates mm -hmm. of the Caribbean and iRobot and all sorts of great action, sci-fi kinds of movies. Mm -hmm. um, but then eventually wanted to start doing that myself. <clears throat> so started writing scripts mm -hmm. and eventually got to the point where I realized that the only way really in this day and age to get into the industry in your own terms is to actually make a movie and show people what you can do. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, it's not impossible to sell a script, but it's much easier if you can actually film your own script and then mm -hmm. show someone what you've done. Uh, <clears throat> so we started with our first movie called Dearly Departed, uh, which is we did in documentary style, uh, but what it is is we were studying a lot of near-death experience concepts and reports about what happens in those mm -hmm. cases. And we wanted to do a film about it, but we didn't want to do a dry documentary. So we kind of said, what if it was possible to take a camera into the afterlife? What would you then be able to do? So we did the film as if mm -hmm. we did that and we're interviewing the spirits of the dead to get their take on life mm -hmm. after death. Mm -hmm. That was our first film. Uh, then we so went what, on. Oh, sorry, but was it a fantasy? It was it was a fictional film, but mm -hmm. based on the real information that we found in near-death experience okay, reports. So you, 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 but you we have... hired actors, and they pretended to be the spirits. But you interviewed people who actually went through that. And... No, no, no. Okay. We only wrote a script based on what people oh, okay, said. Oh, got it, got it, got it. <clears throat> And then we hired actors to play those parts okay. and interviewed them as if they were the spirits mm -hmm. of the dead. Mm -hmm. um, so that's Dearly Departed. And then we went ahead and did uh, First Contact, mm -hmm. which is the documentary on how I became a channel. Mm -hmm. um, and we did that for a number of reasons to let people understand how, how it happened to me, mm -hmm. which is a common question I get. And then also to demystify the concept of channeling, because mm -hmm. a lot of people still think it's sort of a very woo-woo sort of thing. But it's really something everyone has the ability to do, and everyone does do from time to time. It's just a state of being. Mm -hmm. um, when you're in the zone, when you're following your passion, 
you're in a channeling state, <clears throat> which in terms of brainwave frequency is called gamma, between 40 and 100 cycles per second in the brain. And when you're in that state, your brain is capable of processing more information, synthesizing it from a broader perspective. You don't necessarily have to believe that someone is connecting to another entity, but you can understand that what we did demonstrate scientifically by wiring my head to a brainwave machine during a channeling is that it is actually truly a literal altered state in the brain that has some very profound differences. That was actually a very, very interesting part of your documentary because mm. I've, I've watched it. Yeah, yeah the, the actual scientific data of exactly. how, how the, uh, the brain changes. Yes, so we were quite fascinated and quite pleased to be able to present that information mm -hmm. in the documentary and get people to understand that it's not really that far out there and that everyone actually does get into that state when they're mm -hmm. following their, their true path. Wasn't it in your documentary as well uh, that when people are uh, experiencing a similar event, their, um, their brains, uh, actually the activity becomes very similar. That's what I'm saying. Anyone yeah. that goes into the gamma state right, has a exactly. similar kind of state in the brain. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, the brain becomes um, much more hyper-connected. Uh, it synthesizes information on a much higher level. The frequency actually changes, which, according to brain science, is not supposed to be possible mm -hmm. in terms of the set point of your of your uh, focus of consciousness. Um, and so there were many profound things that changed. Mm -hmm. One of the ones I found the most fascinating is we discovered that <clears throat> the part of my brain that's responsible for processing my personality actually shuts off during the channeling. Mm -hmm. So if that part of the brain is shut down, the question is, well, then who's talking? Mm -hmm. So it does give an indication that some mm -hmm. other connection may be going on. But again, we don't insist that anyone has to believe it. Mm -hmm. It's really about the focus of the information because the information given from that state is what makes a difference in people's lives and how it helps them change their lives in mm -hmm. positive ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, remind me, what was the uh, the organization that actually performed that uh, experiment with you? It was a friend who is a brainwave specialist. Okay. It wasn't really an organization. Okay. Um, well, a person can be an organization. Well, okay. <laughs> but yeah, her name is Janine Calaba, okay. okay. and she's a specialist in did, doing uh, that. Did you guys try to do the same experiment on other channelers? No, we were only focused on what was going on in my particular channeling, and it's not really something that we were interested in doing at the time mm -hmm. with anyone else. But I think in the future, uh, we've been researching other people like Janine who can measure other things going on or more things going on so that we can more fully document what's happening to me. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll probably be doing that in the future as well. Because mm -hmm. I know that they uh, they try to measure um, brain activity during meditation. And there's there are uh, some similarities. Yeah. Uh, and I meditate all the time. So right. we, we, that's what I mean. Everyone can do it. Everyone gets in that state. Well, that's not necessarily uh, channeling. It's the channeling state. Right. What you do with it is up to you. But once you're in that state, a number of things are possible. Mm -hmm. But it is the same brainwave state. Mm -hmm. um, so you chose a form of documentary for, mm -hmm. for this particular subject matter. Why? Well, again, we wanted to recount what really happened to me, the story of how it happened, which included UFO sightings mm -hmm. back in 1973. Because when I'm doing the channeling, I see a lot of images, and there was no way the audience can see those things. Uh, when Bashar comes through, I can see what he looks like. I can see what his planet looks like, uh, since he presents himself as an extraterrestrial consciousness. And I wanted people to be able to see the UFO sighting. So we were able to recreate those with special effects. Um, and I wanted to be a truthful story, not really um, uh, done as a narrative, because I really wanted people to understand that we were presenting real information here and we weren't embellishing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we decided basically to do it as a documentary so it could be at least taken somewhat seriously. Mm -hmm. What was interesting is uh, also uh, your friends uh, who were, were with, with you uh -huh. when you guys uh, saw the uh, UFO. Right. Them <clears throat> talking about it. It was mm -hmm. kind of really... Well, yeah, I mean, I'm very grateful that I had witnesses yeah. <laughs> both times because, again, you know, you kind of think, okay, am, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? But, you know, it was such a, a close, broad daylight, solid occurrence both right. times that there was no denying that I was seeing something. 
but yeah, at least I had witnesses that described the same thing. Yeah, I've seen I've seen the UFO, but yeah. like it wasn't just me; it was the half of the city of Almaty where I was right, born. Exactly. So those <laughs> things happen, yeah. uh, but yet it's still considered not real in the media. Oh, crazy. You know? Yeah. Um, speaking of which, uh, you must really encounter a lot of disbelief and, um, you know, doubt from people. Not a lot. Not a lot. Because I think those people just don't gravitate to things that I'm doing if mm -hmm. they don't believe in it. So, you know, I've encountered a couple. But again, that's okay. I don't, I'm mm -hmm. not forcing anyone to believe it. This is just the way it happened. It's the way it presents itself. Mm -hmm. So I just have to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I tell people it's not really about believing that there's an extraterrestrial entity talking through me. Mm -hmm. It's about listening to the information and the, the proof, so to speak, is in applying the information and getting the effect that Bashar is saying will happen. So it's proving that the information is real and works mm -hmm. and changes lives. It doesn't matter whether anyone believes that it's mm -hmm. another part of my own consciousness or whether it's really an extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. That's... That's beyond the point. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, your seminar, I've, uh, it, it just happened so that I, the, there were like, I forget, some crazy number, like 22 or 25 um, tourists from China. Yes, yeah, sometimes you, you large remember? groups from other countries right. will come to the seminars. Uh, and I, I remember uh, I was very touched by um, a girl completely breaking down when Bashar was telling her about you know yeah i heard about that but yeah. I, I don't remember what comes through yeah. so somebody has to tell me later yeah. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. happened it, w it was very touching oh good and um what was interesting from to me is uh, watching the people's reactions and i just happened to be um one of those who had the opportunity to ask questions so um was mm -hmm. i completely satisfied probably not mm -hmm. be but that's I guess normal. There's because... not a lot of time in a public exactly, event to go yeah. deeply. That's what I. That's why I do private sessions, where people get to spend an hour or more really discussing deeply mm -hmm. the issues they want to discuss with Bashar, and then they get a lot more information. Mm -hmm. But sometimes there's just not enough time in a public event to go deeply, and sometimes it's not appropriate in a public event to go mm -hmm. deeply with someone who may have issues that should be better handled in private. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, it. He's touching on the surface as much as he can. Um, and it takes as much time as is possible to allow more people to ask mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Well, um, mm -hmm. let's <coughs> let's talk about Daryl Anka, the okay. filmmaker, for a second, <laughs> and we'll get, we'll definitely get back to Bashar. Sure, sure, sure. So, um, so you have two movies behind your belt as yes. a filmmaker, and, we're working and then on a numerous third. amount of movies that that big movies that you've worked on mm -hmm. as part of the team um, mm -hmm. on um, um, art de department, correct? Uh, miniature effects departments yeah, miniature and effects art department, departments, yes, both. Yeah, yeah. Yes. production design. So what's next? What's next is we are now uh, about to start shooting. We're in pre-production on our third film, which now is a full fictional narrative mm -hmm. movie. Um, still contains some of the UFO element, mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, basically a story about a very grounded scientist that is attempting to sort of invent a new way uh, to travel through space. Mm -hmm who has a lot of father issues and his mother died when he was young. So he's just kind of, you know, messed up in his life. And then he has a UFO sighting and it completely upends his life because to him, these things are not supposed to be real. Mm -hmm. uh, and then he starts trying to find any way to dismiss it, explain it away. And in the course of that, he meets this female artist who's very quirky, thinks very much uh, differently than a lot of people. <clears throat> and the relationship that develops between them she helps him start thinking a little bit outside the box. And what it turns out to be is that she's actually the alien from the UFO that he saw. Is that the Bashar story? No. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> it's, you know, it has elements of it, but it, it's truly a science fiction romantic comedy. Um, and, the, and she is being pursued by a UFO researcher who's trying to prove that aliens are among us. Okay. So there's a lot of action, a lot of comedy, and, and so on and so forth in there. But, you know, they basically fall in love and a mm -hmm. whole other thing happens. Um, so, and the film is called Alienated. Oh. So we are about to start shooting that. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So there must be something else. 
Well, we're also uh, venturing into an area called escape rooms. And I know that a lot of people uh, don't know what those are yet. Even Me though, included. <laughs> even though it's a very fast up and coming new form of entertainment. They mm-hmm. started in 2012. Mm-hmm. Actually, there have been escape rooms online for a while. Mm-hmm. But in terms of the first physical escape room, it mm-hmm. started in Japan in 2012. Where uh, what you do in an escape room is... You go into a room that may be themed in a particular way, like maybe a a murder mystery theme or a pirate theme or some other kind of theme, whether it's either alien theme, alien theme (laughs) or horror or something like that. A group of friends go into the escape room and they try to find clues and solve puzzles to get out in an hour. If they don't get out, that's okay. I mean, they they get out, but they don't solve everything. It doesn't matter because everyone's having so much fun. But it's really good for... team building, Mm -hmm. communication, problem solving. In fact, a lot of companies actually bring their employees to do escape rooms for that reason and to find out, you know, what the different skills and talents of their employees are. Because when you're trying to solve different kinds of problems, it shows you kind of who's a leader, who's a follower. And the way that people think. And the way that people think. So they can get Uh, put people where they really excel, you Mm -hmm. know, by looking at how they go through those kinds of things. But, you know, just the idea of being in these different environments, and a lot of them are really well done. Mm -hmm. So it really helps you believe that you're somewhere else Mm -hmm. going through a completely different kind of adventure than you normally might experience in life. Um, And they're growing very quickly. Like it started with one in 2012. There's over 4,000 around the world What's the secret? Why why is it so... It was so popular. Well, country. because of what I'm basically saying, you get to go out with your friends so in an, an environment. it's an escapism. It's an escapism, but it also teaches you things. Right. And you have a lot of fun and you learn things and you discuss it with your friends later and you try to figure out, you know, how to solve things. Um, it it's just uses a lot of different aspects of a person and it gets you to interact with people in a very different way than you're usually used mm-hmm. to interacting mm-hmm. with them. Um, and it's just caught on. Hmm. So we're going to go so and what's develop your theme? that. Well, we're starting with three different rooms. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> one of which would be the uh, Nautilus, like Captain Nemo, like you're on board mm-hmm. his submarine. Uh, another is a Victorian murder mystery, mm-hmm. um, and another one is as if you are kind of back in the day of Sherlock Holmes in London, trying to stop a terrorist from setting off a bomb. So there are many, many more that we're developing for when the business expands. Mm-hmm. Um, but there can literally be just dozens and dozens of different ooh, kinds ooh, of themes. Where where are they going to look, be located at? We're probably going to be looking in the valley where we live because mm-hmm. there aren't as many escape mm-hmm. rooms in the San Fernando Valley right mm-hmm. now. But there's over 30 escape rooms in Los Angeles. Oh, my God. I had no idea. Maybe yeah. I don't want to escape my life. <laughs> Maybe I enjoy it. <laughs> well, yeah. But this can actually, that's the thing, is this can actually improve your life by bringing bringing what you I learn understand. into yeah. your daily life. So. But yeah, yeah, I tell you what, I mean, we, um, um, people in our industry, we're constantly challenged. Of course. Yeah, and we know. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a natural jumping point right. because making movies, really all you're doing is making a movie that people can be in. It's yeah. a three-dimensional it's, movie. It's, 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 I mean, that's where I see the parallel. Exactly. So I, I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm just wondering who would want... I mean, clearly, like, this is very entertaining, going to a room like that. Clearly, maybe... I, I think the, the young people, that would be the last thing in their mind to think, hmm, what am I good at? How am I thinking and stuff like that? They're just going to go there for entertainment, for... The adventure. To, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting thing for a date. It's an interesting thing for birthday parties. Yeah, it's fun. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. just yeah. fun. Not like going to an amusement park. Yeah, I'll go to the one with Alien. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... And there's a book, right? Yes, I wrote my first novel, <clears throat> uh, which is called Shards of a Shattered Mirror. It's book one called Cryptic. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a fictionalized story based loosely on another entity that I've channeled called Willa Hilla mm-hmm. Crissing. Mm-hmm. And she uh, purports herself to be a hybrid on Earth 700 years in the future. But she's given certain elements of her life that I thought would make an interesting story. And so even though maybe only 5 to 10% of what I have in the book is based on what's come through in the channeling, uh, the rest of it is really just an adventurous science fiction story, the first of five books. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's out now. Um, and, you know, people can access that on my website, DarylAnka.com. 
Um, and I had a lot of fun writing it, and I'm writing the second book now. Very cool. So, Very cool. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And where can people <clears throat> buy it? On DarylAnka.com. Okay, great. So, um, hmm. You know what is just crossing my mind? Of course, to me, I know who Bashar is, right? Mm-hmm. I've done my research and stuff. But like, I'm j- it's just occurring to me that uh, some of the people, and maybe a lot of the people, because I'm actually originally from Kazakhstan, mm-hmm. and, uh, people who work with me are from <clears> different <throat> sides of the world. Right. All of us are immigrants, basically. Yes, yes we are, um, including me. Including you. <laughs> so s- some people around the world might not know who Bashar is. Uh, All right. So what I was thinking, because like I, 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 I just recognized that from the start we we're talking with you, like everybody knows who yeah. Char is, and you <laughs> right. know we're just like yeah, channel here, yeah. like <laughs> sure, 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 sure. It's normal. It's every day. Yeah. So let's talk <clears throat> about Bashar for a second. Sure. Well, like I said, the entire channeling started in 1973 when I had two broad daylight UFO sightings, and that started me researching in that field. Ten years after the sightings. I was introduced to a channel who was conducting seminars at that time. And I listened to the information for a while, and I thought it was very helpful and interesting. But then the entity coming through that channel offered to teach channeling class for whoever was interested. Now, I didn't think channeling could be taught, so I was kind of surprised to hear that. I just thought it was something that sort of happened to you one day uh, automatically. But I went into the class to further my research, not because I thought I was going to be a channel. But halfway through the class, which was a series of different kinds of guided meditations, um, I received what I can only describe as kind of a telepathic contact from Bashar and his people. And in that moment, I understood he was presenting himself as an extraterrestrial consciousness. I understood and remembered that we had made an agreement to do this together in this life. I understood in that split second that the UFO had been his and he had shown it to me to get me to start learning what I needed to learn so I would be ready when the time came to accept this message. But the message also was, now that you remember you made this agreement, and now that it's time to begin, is this something you actually still want to do? Now, I thought I was hallucinating because I didn't know what was happening. I thought it was a side effect of the meditation. But the moment this was happening in my mind, because I hadn't said anything, and this was all happening in like a fraction of a second, it was just all there as information, the entity coming through the channel who was teaching the class stopped talking to the class and turned right to me and said, there's an entity here for you right now if you're ready to begin. And I happened to glance behind me at another classmate who somehow had picked up, in her mind, the image of Bashar I got in my mind. And she was sketching his face on a pad of paper. So I thought, okay, I'm not going crazy. There are two outside validations that I'm not just imagining this. So... I decided to go ahead and keep practicing, and and I did well enough that I started teaching the next class with the teacher. And then a woman came along who was doing the first doctoral thesis paper on the connection between psychology and channeling, and I became one of her subjects. And I would channel for her friends at her house, and words started spreading. So more and more people kept showing up, and we had to start doing it more and more often until I started getting invited to different cities, different countries, And now I'm here 35 years later still doing it. Now, Bashar presents himself as an extraterrestrial being from another civilization. They have a physicality. He's described himself as being what we call a hybrid being between a human and another species called the greys. They're about five feet tall, very pale skin, large eyes, slightly larger heads, uh, relatively slender, uh, and with a very advanced technology but also a very advanced understanding of consciousness, which is why this can happen between us, where we can connect our frequencies, our brainwave frequencies, and I can translate his thoughts into language because that's all really channeling is. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like two tuning forks vibrating in harmony. And when our frequencies lock, you get a translation of his thoughts into the language that I'm programmed with, which is English Mm -hmm. in this case, because he's not speaking anything. He's just sending thoughts. But he has described himself, his people, his world. And ostensibly, he's saying that this sharing of information is the way they begin to make contact with other civilizations. Because they watch and see how much information we absorb, how much we accept. And that shows them whether or not we're ready for more physical contact with them. Um, So this, to him, is the beginning of contact. This is how he does it. And when is the first physical contact? 
with their particular civilization, he's saying the likelihood is somewhere in the window between 2025 and maybe 2033 or 40, but it will start slowly and it will depend on who's really ready. Uh, it might start happening in isolated events, uh, but he's saying probably as he reads the energy by 2050, Earth will know that extraterrestrials exist and that we are to some degree in open contact with them and other species. Well, let's demystify <clears throat> the the whole idea of extraterrestrial. Mm -hmm. Like, what is UFO and extraterrestrial to you? Well, uh, literally what they mean. Extraterrestrial is someone who's not born on Earth. Mm -hmm. UFO, unidentified flying object, but in this case, uh, some of them are actually their spacecraft, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly what I saw. Um, not everything is necessarily an extraterrestrial spacecraft that we see. Some things are normal mm -hmm. uh, misinterpretations, but there are many, many that are really other beings that are observing us, watching us, uh, trying to see how they might be able to interact and help us, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, which is exactly what Bashar civilization is doing, kind of helping us up the ladder as they're climbing the ladder too. It's just mm -hmm. that they're much farther ahead of us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just other family in a sense, galactic family that are helping us to learn that we're not alone, that we're part of a bigger reality, mm -hmm. and that we ourselves, with enough knowledge, can also have a peaceful world and uh, expand out to the stars like they have. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember you were talking about the greys being actually Earthians. Well, yeah, Bashar has explained that what we call the greys are not really aliens in the classical sense. They're actually a mutated group of humans from a parallel version of Earth mm -hmm. who happened to destroy their version of Earth and were incapable at that point of reproducing. So in order to save their civilization and perpetuate their culture, they had to find viable sources of human DNA that were mm -hmm. you know, still good. So they used their technology to tunnel, shall we say, into other parallel realities where Earth hadn't destroyed itself yet. Um, or not at all, <clears throat> and they were able to take human DNA, blend it with their genetics, and create hybrids that could then be viable and mm -hmm. continue their civilization. And Bashar's civilization, according to him, is one of those hybrid groups. Mm -hmm. um, and they're giving this information so that we won't have to go down the same path, so that we won't destroy our world and mutate ourselves <laughs> into the greys in order to survive, which is basically what he's saying those humans from that other Earth did. Mm -hmm. So they're not really alien, which is why they can actually genetically blend with us. Because if they were truly alien, that wouldn't be possible. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, that, in a nutshell, is the story from Bashar's point of view of who the Greys are. Yeah, the, the history of humankind is, is filled with uh, unknown, with, with, with very interesting artifacts, uh, archaeological artifacts, yeah. uh, with... Um, you know. All sorts of weird anomalous things. Yeah. In fact, that's one of the things that I found most fascinating about some of the things that Bashar has said. One thing he said is, when we do finally have open contact with them and other extraterrestrials, one of the first gifts that they're going to give us is our complete history. Because mm -hmm. they have watched it all, they've recorded it all. Mm -hmm. So we will finally know, according to him, everything that's happened in our history, what our real connections are to the stars, and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. at that moment, that will be quite fascinating to see what they give us. Interesting. So do you do you actually um, maybe get in touch with um, like um, scientists uh, that maybe work on this, uh, the, the, the history, the... the, well, not, the so much, hi not so much the history, but the physics. Bashar has had several private conversations with physicists. Mm -hmm. They always walk away very happy with what he's told mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So I know that some people are working on some of the information mm -hmm. that he's given. Um, but it's still happening sort of behind the scenes mm -hmm. because they don't want to necessarily go public with the fact that they're talking to a channel because it could hurt their careers at this point. Uh, I was just going to ask <clears throat> your names. <laughs> Can't do that. <laughs> Can't do that. But several physicists have had what conversations. What about neuroscientists? Some neuroscientists mm -hmm. as well. I, w I really would have loved uh, the history <clears throat> Science, like people who actually study history, and but not just history that we right. study in the books. It's particularly, like I grew up sure. as a kid during <clears throat> Soviet Union. Sure, our history sure, has sure. been rewritten. Yeah, of course, of my people. I you think know most I mean? like, of our history has been rewritten. Yeah, <laughs> and and uh, the, thank God because I belong to the the people 
the 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 group of people that have nomadic history, right? Mm-hmm. So there was this a tradition of vocal, uh, what do you call it, uh, tra- transfer of information. Sure. You know, so we kind of like kept some of this knowledge, but what drives me crazy is, is it, there's uh, these gaps. Mm-hmm. You big know ones. what I mean? And, and uh, really big gaps. Yeah. And, and then uh, if you go, and then I, I, I don't even look at those books anymore because studying at school, the history of my own people just yeah. need, they aggravated me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, 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 it yeah. was just so... Yeah. yeah, I don't know if any actual historians have talked mm-hmm. to him. Certainly people have asked history mm-hmm. questions. Um, and he's talked about some of the past history mm-hmm. that he knows of. But I don't, no one's ever told me that they're actually a historian. So mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe they have, maybe they haven't. Well, maybe that, that would be a really cool suggestion. Well, yeah. Know. Well, yeah. we're open to all of it. Mm-hmm. We're, we're actually, one of the physicists is, I don't know when it's going to happen, but he's, he's attempting to talk to other physicists and try to put a panel mm-hmm. of physicists together mm-hmm. to sit down and all of them just ask questions mm-hmm. of Bashar. Um, but I, I have no idea when that might actually occur because that's sort of that in, in be their brilliant. court. Yeah, it's in there. It's up to them to decide mm-hmm. when they're comfortable with mm-hmm. that. But mm-hmm. yeah, we're open to it. Mm-hmm. That'd be that'd be really interesting. Yeah. And any um, any chance that he would come out physically? Bashar? Yeah. No, not yet. We're not ready for that, because one of the things he's explained is <clears throat> while there have been certain contacts with certain kinds of extraterrestrials. Some ETs operate on an extremely high energy frequency. And if we were physically exposed to them without proper preparation, <clears throat> it's like their energy would overwhelm us. It would be like it would force things to the surface within us that we're not ready to face about ourselves. And it could actually cause a fear reaction or a psychotic shock because it's like having, he's, an, he's used the analogy, it's like saying, we're operating on a very low frequency here. They're operating on a very high frequency. So imagine a slow moving gear and a fast moving gear suddenly being jammed together. You're gonna strip the teeth off the gears. So the reason he's giving this information is so that if we absorb it, we uplift our frequency, we become closer to their frequency, and then the gears can mesh physically. Mm -hmm. So he's saying they have to keep arm's distance so they don't actually cause damage to us psychically until we're truly ready to face a lot of the things within ourselves that we have compartmentalized and kept hidden Mm -hmm. and things we're afraid to look at. That energetically makes a big difference between us and them, and they have to wait until we're closer to their vibration so they do not cause harm to mm-hmm. us individually or even to our whole society. Mm-hmm. But there will come a time when that will be possible. Mm-hmm. But they've done this many times. See, Bashar has explained that in his society, he's what they call a first contact specialist. Mm-hmm. So he's made contact with many different civilizations. They have a protocol that they follow to make sure that nothing bad happens to the society that they're contacting. Mm -hmm. And so he's going through the motions. He's taking the steps. And we just have to trust him that he knows what he's doing so that he doesn't do harm to us Mm -hmm. unintentionally. Hmm. Cosmic bureaucracy. Well, yeah, but a ben- <laughs> but a beneficial one. <laughs> yeah, but a beneficial one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when you just started channeling mm-hmm. Bashar, mm-hmm. how did you learn to trust that it's actually uh, something that... Oh, okay, you, you had that... Something you, positive? No, well, first of all, something positive, but the second of all, uh, true. And third of all... I mean, you've got to have found the mission in it for yourself or sure. else you would have not done it, right? Yeah. Well, and what yes. is the mission for you, Daryl, not Bashar? Well, the mission for me is to apply the information in my own life and be a living example that the information works. Mm-hmm. But the idea is that by the time the channeling happened for me, remember that I had done months of study of channeling. Mm-hmm. So by the time it happened, I, will, I knew there was nothing to be afraid of. And I knew that all it was really about was getting my own fear-based beliefs out of the way, trusting the flow of information to do what it needed to do in a positive context, uh, and just letting go, because that's really the big secret, is just letting it happen. Um, It didn't matter, again, to me whether Bashar was real. I knew that the information was helpful. 
And therefore, that was the most important focus is, is the information making a difference in people's lives in a positive way? And when people started coming back to me and saying, hey, you know, Bashar said this and Bashar said that and I applied it in my life and it worked. And so thank you very much. I'm much happier now. Everything's working better now. That to me was what I needed to hear to know, okay, I'm doing something. Whatever that is. It, it's working. Yeah. Just keep doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and like anything, when you practice more and more and more, it gets clearer and clearer and better and better and more and more all-encompassing and more profound and deeper. So you just keep doing it and see yeah. what happens. <laughs> so 30-some years of channeling. Yeah, 35. 35, wow. <clears throat> uh, so you must know a lot of information because they, 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 I do now. Yeah. Sure. It's all rubbed off on me. I've studied a lot of what he said. I'm actually writing another book about that because what this is all kind of added up to as I've <clears throat> understood his principles. Uh, I'm creating a book called one, a unified theory of metaphysics for the first time. I think I'll be creating a framework like a unified framework, like in science, in physics, to explain every single different kind of metaphysical mm -hmm. phenomena and show how a lot of the definitions that we have are outdated and we need to understand it from a new point of view, a new definition that's more modern, more streamlined, and actually giving us a description of the mechanism involved that creates the metaphysical phenomena because a lot of the definitions we have are very misleading. Um, for example... Uh, Bashar's talked about the idea of telepathy. Now, most people say, oh, what's telepathy? Well, you're reading someone else's mind. That's not true, according to Bashar. It's all about frequency, resonance of energy. And the idea of telepathy is that you're not reading someone else's mind. You are mirroring their frequency so closely, matching their frequency so closely, you have the same thoughts at the same time mm -hmm. they do. So again, it's that tuning fork thing where you go in sync mm -hmm. and you lock in and your experience then becomes a similar experience to so, them. So what happens, sorry. That's okay. So what happens if it's not just a thought? We're talking about the telepathy, right? But that's what telepathy is, uh, right. is being in the same wavelength. I just want to shift it to something yeah. else. Like yeah, sure. What, what, what about those uh, uh, synchronicities? Synchronicity is part of the underlying structure of existence. Mm -hmm. In other words, synchronicity is physical reality's way of showing you that everything is connected. Mm -hmm. It's just that it has to do it in linear fashion, one thing after mm -hmm. another, mm -hmm. because that's the way we perceive reality and physical reality. So it's just showing you that when you're on a certain wavelength, you attract certain things and that those things are indicative of exactly what level you're on. So a lot of times, let's say when people see synchronistic numbers, you know, like I see 10, 10 all the time and that tells me when i see it i'm in the right frequency i'm in alignment with my true self i'm on the right path at that moment so i use it like a road sign okay i'm doing okay i'm in the right state i do, I do the same exactly except it's my birthday number well exactly well that's my birth time ah 10 okay. 10 p.m okay. so but different people have different numbers for different mm -hmm. reasons mm -hmm. but other synchronistically situ you know opportunities that come to you are still indicative of what frequency you're in because there is positive and negative synchronicity synchronicity never stops it's built into the structure mm -hmm. of existence mm -hmm. uh it's just that when you're operating in a positive state you get the positive synchronicity in the mm -hmm. negative state you get the negative synchronicity and each reinforces the state mm -hmm. that you're in so um that's just the way reality works so you have to learn to use that to your advantage and that's what the idea of the unified theory is going to do is explain all of these concepts in such a way that you understand the mechanism instead of getting caught up in a description of the experience, which is fine as a description of an experience. Oh, I'm reading your mind. But that's not a description of what's actually happening physically. Mm -hmm. So by clearing away the old definitions and bringing in the new ones, people can have a much better understanding of how reality works and a more conscious control over what they experience in life because they're not getting misled by a definition that's been outdated for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, we need to step into the 21st century with metaphysics. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's hopefully what the unifying framework will provide mm -hmm. is some way to tell the difference and see how all metaphysical phenomena are connected and the product of one basic principle. Mm 
Mm-hmm. It's it's so interesting because like I I keep listening and the, my 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 thoughts are going from uh huh I have to ask about this <laughs> to like uh huh I have to ask about that uh-huh. and then it keeps on going and I'm like what what was I gonna <laughs> ask because <laughs> like I keep going with your thought mm-hmm. but um. <clears throat> So after 35 years of channeling and, and obtaining all this uh, mm-hmm. knowledge, what remains mystery? I'm sure there are many things that remain For you. a mystery. Many things. I mean, there's all sorts of cosmic questions and things like that. I'm always learning. I mean, even Bashar's people are still learning, and even though they're thousands of years ahead of us. It never stops. It never ends. There's always some new mystery, some new idea to explore. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I'm transitioning not only from doing just the channelings, but I'm also using this information now to transition as a public speaker myself, because I understand enough of it to be able to talk about it like we're doing now Mm -hmm. on my own. So that's another phase that I'm going into, uh, exploring, well, you know, what was I going to do with this information beyond a certain point? Mm -hmm. So this is one answer. It's allowing me to become let's say, my version of Bashar Mm -hmm. as myself Mm -hmm. by becoming more of a public speaker. And that way it allows more people who are not necessarily into channeling to receive the information. So it's another way of getting the information out, Mm -hmm. just like making a movie about it was another way of getting the information out. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's about exploring what are all the ways that I can follow my passion and my excitement to express these ideas um, and even in the escape room, there's opportunities for mm-hmm. doing things where people are solving puzzles that bring them to other realizations. It just depends on how cleverly you design the puzzles. Mm-hmm. So it's about exploring many different forms of your passion and doing your best to express mm-hmm. them all to be your true self. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's uh, it's like uh, Bashar always says, follow your passion, follow your, your bliss. Yeah. Because that is who you are. In other words... <clears throat> We have the physical mind and we have the non-physical higher mind. Mm -hmm. What we experience as the sensation of passion, excitement, creativity, love, that's actually our body's physical translation of the language of the higher mind, which is just energy frequencies. Mm -hmm. But that's how we translate it. So when we're willing to act physically on our passion, because physical action is the language of physical reality, Mm -hmm. um, when we do that, we are actually answering the higher mind who's sent the passion energy to us and saying, I hear you Mm -hmm. and I'm willing to align with that. And I'll show you I am by acting on it. And then the higher mind can reinforce that. Mm -hmm. And it becomes this relationship that keeps building. What is the higher mind? It's the non-physical side of ourselves. It's the spirit side of ourselves. The idea being that what we call a soul sort of splits itself to have a physical experience into two. It creates or remains partly non-physical and creates a physical focus that allows us to experience ourselves as physical beings. But the higher mind sort of remains on the mountaintop while the physical mind is sort of down in the valley and wandering around. But it can't see around the next corner. But the higher mind can. So when the higher mind's going, go this way, go this way, go this way, by sending us the idea of this would be exciting, this would be passionate, wouldn't it? If we go with that, then we follow a path of least resistance because it's guiding us from on high because it has a broader perspective. If we ignore it, then it's going, well, okay, go ahead, but you're going to probably fall into some holes Mm because I'm telling you to go this way. Mm -hmm. So we purposely always maintain guidance from on high Mm -hmm. um, when we decide to have a physical incarnation uh, because this physical reality is really nothing more than, in a sense, a dream. It's like we don't really ever leave spirit. That's our natural state. But we're dreaming that we have. And no matter how solid this seems, it's an illusion. Yeah, yeah. Even in physics. Even in physics, they know that. Mm -hmm. So metaphysics and physics are starting to kind of overlap in certain ways. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know a lot of physicists don't like to hear that, but I do believe that that's true. After watching thousands <clears throat> of different times uh, the uh, double slit experiment, I'm completely and convinced. entanglement yeah. and all that. I know, <laughs> yes. but that's okay. You know, they have a way that they need to express those concepts, mm-hmm. and that's fine. Mm-hmm. And but I do see more and more physicists on the cutting edge mm-hmm. going. You know, we've been hearing this for thousands of years, <laughs> yes, and it's just that they like to find the math that demonstrates it, and that's great because that's another language. That's mm-hmm. fine, um, but. 
that's I think what's happening is is we're seeing uh, an expansion of knowledge and overlapping of knowledge uh, to where more and more people can understand that we're creating this reality with our belief systems. We're here to discover ourselves from another point of view. That's why we have physical reality. It's almost like you have to forget who you are in order to remember who you are from another angle, another mm -hmm. perspective, and discover something more. And that's how reality grows, because the structure of reality, the basic structure, never changes. It is what it is. Existence is what it is. But our experience of reality, our experience of existence, our perspective of existence, that's what always changes. Mm -hmm. And that's how creation expands, not that the structure expands, the experience of the structure expands mm -hmm. oh speaking of structure <clears throat> yes. let's talk about it sure what is it the structure of existence is expressed by Bashar in what he calls the five laws the first law is you exist there's nothing you can do to change that because existence is its own quality and what exists can't become non-existent it can change form but it can't become non-existent <clears throat> there's a more complex way of saying why that's true but one of the easiest ways to explain it is when Bashar says the reason that existence can't become non-existent is because by definition non-existence doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it never will become anything other than what it is as existence itself. Mm -hmm. That's the first law. Mm -hmm. The second is everything is here and now. Time and space are an illusion. Mm -hmm. The third is the one is the all, the all are the one. Everything is made of the one thing mm -hmm. and the one thing experiences itself as everything that it is. Mm -hmm. The fourth is what you put out is what you get back, what a lot of people call the law of attraction, what some people call karma, but not in a punishing way. It's just a reflection. In other words, physical reality is like a mirror. What you put out, it has no choice but to send that back to you in some way, shape, or form. And the fifth law is everything changes except the laws. They're mm -hmm. the structure. But what changes, again, as I said, is your experience and perspective of the structure. Wait, so those five laws are true for every reality or for anywhere, all? anytime, anyhow. Mm -hmm. They are a description of the structure of existence mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Everything else, according to Bashar, is an opinion, a perspective, a belief. And those can be changed. Mm -hmm. But the structure can never be changed because mm -hmm. it is what it is. So I have a, a <clears throat> kind of a mathematical way of seeing things, sure. right? It's just I can't help it. My mother was a mathematician. <laughs> My father oh, okay, was an engineer. Rubbed <laughs> off on you deeply. <laughs> so I do see numbers and stuff, and mm -hmm. I always have to have the foundation for having so what we call belief. Sure. So I do observe things, and I, I, mm -hmm. I do my research, and I went into years of uh, listening to, I don't know, uh, biology lectures, mm -hmm. um, physics, quantum physics, astrophysics, right. and so on and so forth. Um, but um, so, and it's it's really hard for me when there's a gap in in my knowledge. You sure, know what I mean, sure. it's like I I want to know. Sure. And so when we talk about the structure of everything, mm -hmm. right? Existence. Yeah. Existence. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Bashar laughed at me for <laughs> saying that. Uh, so when we talk about structure of existence, um, a lot of the people, a lot of people will have a trouble understanding how is that that you have your own ego, mm -hmm. meaning like you have your own self. Sure. But then you are part, like <clears throat> one with everyone, right? Both are true. Right. And, and, and then how, how can that exist? Everywhere and anywhere. Well, it's a holographic structure. Okay. Um, one way that Bashar has kind of described it is imagine yourself standing in a hall of mirrors. Mm -hmm. You're seeing an infinite number of reflections of yourself from different angles, but you're still you. So what's happening there is both a number of reflections and the whole experience at once that is the one mm -hmm. that everything is made of. So you have to have both. In other words, what he's explained is he's answered what is consciousness. Consciousness is, to him, self-awareness. It is the ability to know the self by knowing that there is also other than the self. Mm -hmm. So existence, to him, is self-reflective. Existence wouldn't know itself if it wasn't. If it was completely, truly homogenous, there would be no awareness of another and then no awareness of a self by difference. Mm -hmm. So consciousness to him is literally the product of self-reflective existence that can create within itself the idea of an other than itself. 
And by creating an idea of other than, you get the reflection of self. I'm different than that. That's different than me. Even though it's still made of the same thing. Mm -hmm. But it's happening within existence, not outside of it. So we are both the one and everything in the one. Mm -hmm. Because there's nothing outside of it. It is everything. It's the only thing you can make anything from. Mm -hmm. But we're all reflections of it. So it can experience itself as the one, all the reflections. And it can experience itself as all the individual reflections. So it's a very holographic kind of thing. This was expressed actually very poetically thousands of years ago by a concept that was called Indra's net. And Indra's net was a collection, almost like a, a necklace, if you want to say, or an interlocking web of perfect pearls. Because if you look at any pearl in the net, it actually contains the reflections of every other pearl in the net. So you only have to go to one pearl to get all the information of the entire net, but that doesn't discount that there are also many pearls in the net, each mm -hmm. having its own point of view. So it's that kind of holographic relationship that existence is built mm -hmm. on and how it experiences itself as everything that mm -hmm. it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. Does that explain it at all? Yes, um, uh, definitely. And um as you speak, all these memories are going through the theories, for example, Tom Campbell, mm -hmm. the, you, you know, his theory of, um, 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 reality being a basically self procreating computer game in a sense, in yeah. a sense. Yeah. yeah and it kind of like, of it, it was, it was kind of interesting because when I was <clears> listening <throat> to him in particular, and then there's, of course, there's tons of works by different kind of, of uh, uh, amazing scientists talking about holographic yep. nature of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I remember, um, I guess because I, I'm not the true scientist, I'm just like, okay. you know, loving it. Mm -hmm. So I guess when I was listening to Tom Campbell, it was kind of like, hmm, that's interesting, because he was talking about the computer game, which is something that we all can relate to. Right. You need analogies to understand. Right. It, yeah. It's kind of easier to, sure. you know, imagine and understand. Then all of a sudden the Big Bang makes sense. All of a sudden the, sure. you know, deja vu makes sense. Mm -hmm. or, you know. Yeah, you can see that's what I mean about creating this unified framework. You can explain all the phenomena mm -hmm. when you have that framework. Which, by the way, would explain infinite amount of realities, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And Absolutely. existing, coexisting in the same space. Yeah, it almost not only explains it, it almost demands it. Yeah, obviously. It has to yeah, be that yeah, way. It has yeah. to be, yeah. Like all these programs in the computer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> very, very interesting. Um, but like I said, my mind keeps going because, sure. well, we. Well, who wants it to stop? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so is there a conscious then? Because meaning. Yeah, consciousness is built in. Me, yes, well, it's everything and anything. Mm -hmm. Everything is, yeah, everything is a form of consciousness. Right, but it almost makes it... Um, if you make an analogy as mm -hmm. a computer or holographic reality, is it real consciousness then? Yes. Is it? Yes. Because everything is built out of consciousness. So it may express consciousness very differently than we recognize. Here's a good example. Somebody asked Bashar once, you know, are rocks conscious? <clears throat> he says, well, they're made of consciousness. They're not consciously expressing themselves in the way that you are. But look at it this way. Are you aware of the rock? Yes. Well, it's aware of itself through your awareness of it but it's not aware of itself in the same way you're aware of yourself. In a sense, it's almost using you as a reflection to point out that it's an individual rock. Mm -hmm. So however it actually experiences that may be very alien to us and very foreign to us and nothing like the way we think of our own consciousness, but it's still a reflection of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it may have very different ways of understanding that that have nothing to do with the way we call understanding yes um actually it's so funny because uh, out of curiosity once i did um past life regression mm -hmm. I'm, I'm i'm super curious person so i do all kinds of things just, sure, well, just yeah me too what happens <laughs> and um one of those so 
you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I believe if we are all one, mm -hmm. then I don't really believe in reincarnation because well, exactly. we are all reincarnation of each other. So A, remembering, yes. so I just did that for yeah, the yeah, for, yeah, yeah. for the experience. See, that's okay. You can you can use you can use the experiential definition if it helps you understand something. Bashar is not trying to take that away from people. He's just trying to tell you, you should also understand what the underlying reality is. Mm -hmm. So we talk about things like past lives and getting in touch with them. And that's fine. If that helps us in some way, shape or form. All he's simply saying is it all exists at the same time. Right. Therefore, if you understand that, then you understand that what's actually happening is <clears throat> when you make a past life connection, it's actually a connection you're making from the present to another present incarnation that's overlapping yours simultaneously. It exists at the same time you do. But from our linear perspective, when we think of time and space, when we see things from a time and space perspective, <clears throat> we make this connection in the present, but we interpret it as a past memory because we're used to thinking that way. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean it's not actually a connection of energy being made in the present. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> he's saying, <clears throat> this is why you can have that that weird thing happen where you get 50 people saying, oh, I was Julius Caesar, or I was Cleopatra in a past we life. We all have. Because we can all make connections to those people. Right. Because they all exist now. Therefore, that explains how 50 different people can actually feel that that's true because they can all make connections to those people who exist right alongside of us in a different frequency or parallel time frame. Right. Well, when I did that, uh, and we'll get back to the time space. Sure. But when I uh, did that, um, uh, the past life regression ther therapy. Yes, yes, yes. Called. So I only did once. Mm -hmm. I've seen couple of different things and one of them I was a rock we'll see that's what I'm saying and so I will never actually treat anything or anyone um, right as non-consciousness anymore it's all and reflection. it's not even like it could have been my uh, <clears throat> fantasy it could have been anything doesn't matter it doesn't matter because I all of a sudden I have experienced <clears throat> for right I don't know however many minutes mm -hmm. being a rock see that's what matters Physical reality isn't real, but the experience of it is. Right. And therefore, that's how you learn things. That's how you get different perspectives of things. That's how you change and that's how you grow. So he's not invalidating the experience. He's just saying learn that there is a difference between experience and the underlying mechanism so that you have more understanding of how reality works and then can create the kind of experiences that you really prefer to instead of ones that you don't. So how did the ancient people, particularly indigenous cultures, how did they know that everything is one? Because we all know these things. Mm -hmm. It's just that a lot of Western culture has forgotten this for a variety of reasons, most of which have to do with fear-based beliefs that create a sensation of being cut off from that knowledge. Arrogance, arrogance, fear, mm -hmm. what have you. Yeah, because the nomadic culture in particular, mm -hmm. uh, very uh, respectful of nature. Of course. Yeah. And we're getting back to that slowly in mm -hmm. certain Western cultures. Mm -hmm. But we all know this stuff intuitively, mm -hmm. you know, but we're remembering it. So time and space. Yes. Um, any chance for a time machine anytime soon? Well, again, I'm sure there Which can be. It exists. Yes, but it's not the science fiction concept of no, time of travel. Yeah. Bashar basically has explained that what you're actually doing is simply shifting into a parallel reality that looks like your past, but it's not yours. Mm. It's a different parallel reality. So the idea of creating those so-called time paradoxes can't actually exist. Mm. If you have a time machine and you go back <laughs> to when you were younger, and visit yourself, you're not actually visiting yourself. You're visiting a young version of yourself in another parallel reality that's very similar to yours, mm -hmm. but it's not yours. So the grandfather paradox can't really exist mm -hmm. because, God forbid, <laughs> you kill someone in that reality. That's their history. It's mm -hmm. not your history. Right. You won't disappear mm -hmm. because you come from another parallel reality. Mm -hmm. So time travel, sort of. But not in the not science fiction it, no. way. No, not collapsing it. Because okay. every possible timeline exists. So you're just shifting around. 
interesting. More than anything. Yeah. Um, very interesting. Yeah, and he sort of he sort of demonstrated it physically in terms of what he's saying being physically real. So imagine you okay, imagine you take a picture of yourself at ten years old. Okay. There you are. There's mm -hmm. the picture. And then you grow up and you're now you're thirty. <clears throat> and you take a picture of yourself at thirty. There's the picture. Then you invent a time machine and decide I'm gonna go visit my ten year old self. So you get in the time machine, you go back and you stand next to your 10-year-old self and take another picture. Well, Bashar says, but what have you got on the table? You have a different picture. The picture of the original 10-year-old is still a 10-year-old. It hasn't changed. The picture of you standing with the 10-year-old is a different picture. They both exist at the same time. So you didn't change that picture. You went to another reality where you could stand next to your 10-year-old self in that reality mm -hmm. because all the photographs exist side by side none of them disappear they're all there i'd still go back i'd want to see my parents even if they're not mine <laughs> right well no and if the reality is so similar to yours yeah. you can't really tell the difference yeah. then yes you could experience a lot of and things and learn a lot of things he just wants you to understand that you're not actually in your timeline anymore mm -hmm. that's all well it's been fascinating it has <laughs> <laughs> yeah very interesting and uh, of course i have a lot more questions and uh, they, they just will never end no it doesn't and that's <laughs> great <laughs> yes so thank you so much Daryl. thank you gia i really appreciate the opportunity and the work that you're doing as well thank you